Breathless and hopeful media tell us that democratic socialism is the next new political thing in America. It's bold, it's edgy, it's activist. Some students tell me it's easier to get a date if you're a comrade. <laughs> Maybe there's something to this, something real, something substantial, something lasting. Maybe it'll be a big part of our future, important in our lives especially since the young seem to love it so, especially compared to capitalism. Democratic socialism, call it Demsoc for short. <laughs> Are you also a fresh, proud, young Demsoc? Do you, as they say, feel the burn? If you're a hipster, you really dig it. You also have real, live politicians willing to openly declare themselves socialists. We see they're unapologetic, they're even sanctimonious and eager to win your vote. Senator Sanders, Senator Warren, Mayor de Blasio, Rep Ocasio-Cortez, all there to help, all there to lead the cause, to lead the way, to usher America toward socialism, or if necessary, push her, into a bold new realm of endless opportunity, of social justice, of leisure time, of tuition-free, debt-free college. Wait, what? <laughs> That's my pay. That was all. Doesn't socialism have a bad reputation? A black name? A dark history? But democracy has a good one, right? The people know best. What people? Any people. So long as it's a majority, and no matter if, or how much they're ill-informed, or stupid, or apathetic, or fickle, or envious, or vicious. Who are you to doubt? Who are you to question? Who are you to want to put democracy in chains? That's the name of a book by a Duke colleague of mine, Nancy McLean, who's critical of people of liberty. You're trying to put democracy in chains. See, you can no more question the will of the people than the word of God. Read your Rousseau, because he said it first. And what ensued were guillotines, gas ovens, and gulags, wielded by Rousseau's many acolytes, from Robespierre to Chavez. Now, you know this. For decades, democracy has been held up as an idol to which we must genuflect, else be called tyrants. Surely democracy can't steer us wrong. It's holy, it's pure, it's clean, it's white. Maybe like a whitewash, it can even disguise an underlying basic blackness. Maybe no one will notice when the means justify the ends. Or to be more specific, when the clean means of democracy justify the dirty ends of socialism. But not so fast, because today, as we'll soon see, not even socialism is viewed by the Rousseau Democrat types as dark or dirty or evil. On the contrary, the case made now is that socialism is ethical, not practical. It's socially just, it's egalitarian, it's humanitarian. And they claim that the mass murder, famine-wracked, poverty-stricken record of socialism in the 20th century is no ancestor of what they now desire. It's no part of the new vision, we're told. That was a practice run, a preseason game of no significance. Mistakes were made. A hundred million people died from it. But it'll be different this time because the people will rule, and the people are God, and God is good. Oh, my God. The new God. The rise of the democratic socialists. We're reckoning with the consequences of putting profit above everything else in society, she says. And what that means is people can't afford to live. For me, it's a question of priorities, and right now I don't think our model is sustainable. I don't feel good living in an unequal society. Capitalism is an ideology of capital. The most important thing is the concentration of capital and to seek and maximize profits. So me, for me, capitalism is irredeemable. 
two years ago a Boston College degree in economics and a bartender. Now the second coming of Karl Marx. How did that happen? Democratic socialism, what's going on here? How real is this? How new? Who knew? How crazy is this? How threatening? Not in the least, some say. What's so scary about democracy? Its root term, by the way, is demos, meaning people. What's wrong with people? Simple enough. Democracy is government of the people, by the people, for the people. Who could object? Didn't Abe Lincoln say that? Yes, in the Getty version of drafts, he said that. <laughs> but wait, Lincoln was a Republican, not a Democrat. And when he spoke the words, constitutions limited government power. A Bill of Rights forbade Congress from passing any law abridging a whole distinct list of rights, <clears throat> regardless of what the majority wished. More than half Americans at the time couldn't even vote, weren't eligible to vote. Not so democratic. Historically, Democrats are the party of racism, segregation, and slavery, but unlimited voting. While the Republicans are the party of civil rights, abolition, and constitutionalism, today, though, American Democrats, you know, condemn all their foes as racists and not sufficiently socialist. You won't get much clarity from leading Democrats. Many of you may remember this. In 2015, talk show host Chris Matthews asked the head of the DNC, the Democratic National Party, uh, he had an exchange about socialism. I was going to show the video. It's a lot funnier, but it takes too much time. Matthews, what's the difference between a Democrat and a socialist? Schultz, ah, uh, ooh, ah. Uh. I transcribed it. That's what she said. Matthews. I used to think it's a big difference. What do you think it is? Schultz, uh, what, uh, oh. Matthews, a Democrat like Hillary and a socialist like Bernie, go. Schultz, the more important question is what's the difference between a Democrat and a Republican? Matthews, what's the difference between a Democrat and a socialist? You're the chairman of the Democratic Party. Tell me the difference between you and a socialist. Wasserman Schultz, the uh, uh, relevant debate we'll have is the difference between Democrats and Republicans. Matthews, Democrats and socialists, I think there's a huge difference, unquote. Six months later, he interviewed Hillary, the actual nominee. Matthews, quote, I want to try to help you for this audience, it was a Democratic audience. Locate yourself politically in this country. We have Trump out there. We have Bernie, who calls him a socialist, calls himself a socialist. Nobody uses that derogatory term anymore. Bernie does. It's his. He loves that label. I'd say you're a pretty typical Democrat. What's the difference between a socialist and a Democrat? Hillary. Well, uh, <laughs> Matthews, is that a question you can't answer, don't want to answer? Clinton. Well, you know, if you ask Matthews, I'm asking you. You're a Democrat, he's a socialist. Would you like someone to call you a socialist? I wouldn't like someone calling me a socialist. Clinton, I'm not one. Matthews, okay, okay, what's the difference between a socialist and a Democrat? Clinton, I'm a progressive Democrat. How's that different, Matthews, how's that different from a socialist? Clinton, I'm a progressive Democrat who likes to get things done. I believe we're better off in this country when we're trying to solve problems together, getting people to work together, unquote, as my wife would say, blah, 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 blah. Same old, same old. So until recently, top Democrats claimed to not know what socialism was or knew what it was, but thought it was incompatible with democracy or else wouldn't admit it publicly that the two might even be compatible. Not many of them say so publicly now. The current chairman of the DNC, Tom Perez, said this recently when asked about it. He said, quote, Republicans are using the term socialism as the oldest trick in the book. When Social Security, the minimum wage, Medicare, and Obamacare were debated, all they had in common was Republican opponents saying the programs were socialism. In fact, those bills were making capitalism work. That's what Democrats are for, making capitalism work for everyone, not just for a few, unquote. So now we hear the party's not really for democratic socialism, but democratic capitalism. It's a mixture, isn't it? It's a hash of things, really, reflecting a deeper kind of underlying philosophic mix. 
that's eclectic, that's contradictory, that's arbitrary. But is that what government should be? Capricious, arbitrary? Let's get a sense of the political change we've seen in the last 25 years. Three leaders, three countries, Reagan, Thatcher, Mulroney, America, Britain, Canada. This is quite a long run, 1979 to 1993. Whatever their faults, whatever their inconsistencies, it's undeniable that this trio moved the West toward more political economic freedom. But the true believers in socialism remained, of course, in academia. Here's one. This was the dominant economic textbook for 50 years, 1948 to 1998. MIT, Paul Samuelson, a book that says capitalism is unstable and there must be massive government intervention to keep it going. His view of socialism, this is 1989. The Soviet economy is proof that contrary to what many skeptics had earlier believed, a socialist command economy can function and even thrive. Amazing. Two years later, the end of the Soviet Union, the dissolution of the Soviet Union, the utter complete collapse of the Soviet Union, the end of the Cold War, won by Reagan, Thatcher, and Mulroney, to the great chagrin of academia. Raise your hand if you're 28 years or lower. You weren't even born at this time. You weren't even born. It was the biggest of all of us older than that. It was the biggest event, I think, political economic of our lives. The end of the Soviet Union without a shop being fired. We won. Capitalism won. Is that what the socialists are now going to admit? 1991. Yay. Twenty years later, what the heck? Right, 2009, what the heck? We're all socialists now. We're going to occupy Wall Street. Capitalism kills. Democratic Socialists of America. Why? Just because the financial markets fell a couple of years? That we abandoned whole systems because the market went down? Because they blamed it on capitalism. Too much deregulation of Wall Street. Not government intervention in the economy, artificially promoting housing and Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, no, it was capitalism that was to blame. How can you forget what happened with the end of the Cold War that easily? <clears throat> it's something I wrote at the time. Indeed, where did they go? Or were there any? Is the failure of socialism alone enough to be pro-capitalist? Remember this, if you're old enough? This was a president who said the era of big government is over in 1996, so five years after the end of the Soviet Union and the Republicans had taken the House for the first time in 40 years, I think it was. Pretty amazing, pretty much an admission. And his, and his, politics weren't, his policies weren't substantially overturning the Reagan years. Nope, just kidding. The era of big government was not over. Here's a graph just of US spending as a share of the economy and the government debt as a share of the economy. That's the blue, uh, red line. And the line and the green line up and down is when Clinton said the era of big government is over. It's bigger and better than it, better than ever, isn't it now? It did dip below. It leached a low of 2,000 in terms of government share of the economy, diversion of the economy, but now it's higher than ever. Now, fast forward 23 years to more recently another State of the Union address by the current president who declared America will never be a socialist country. Interesting. The era of big government is over, notice, was put in the negative. What does that mean we're in now? The era of smaller government? The era of capitalism? It was in the negative. We're just not big government anymore. But similarly, last January, America will never be a socialist country. Why was this even a question? 
six months ago. He said, we're alarmed by new calls to adopt socialism in our country. Again, didn't we win the Cold War? Didn't we defeat socialism a quarter century ago? Wasn't the end of the USSR the end of the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics? That's the name of it. <clears throat> and earlier, by the way, in defeating Nazism, wasn't that yet another form of socialism, namely national socialism, which is what Nazi stands for. It's a contraction of national and socialism. So again, America will never be a socialist country, but then what will it be? When? How? Notice again the negative. What we are not, what we won't become, but what will we be? What do we want to be, moral and politically? What will we stand for? Because you know, if we stand for nothing, we'll fall for anything, including a vile, bitter, old, blithering idiot like Bernie Sanders. But we can also, you notice, fall for presidents who are inexperienced, narcissistic, and authoritarian. The last two have been that from different parties. What we're witnessing today, not just in North America, but also in Latin America and in Europe, is a simultaneously ri simultaneous rise in nationalism on the right and socialism on the left. And that's no accident, because each reflects basically a rejection of individualism. The more the one side advances, the more the other is fueled and agitated to advance in kind. And they compete to become to each other increasingly ridiculous, bellicose, and brutal. That's the alleged choice we're given. And the two eventually could synthesize, of course, into national socialism. That's what Dr. Leonard Peikoff warned about in 1982 in his book, The Ominous Parallels. Inputs to his forecast, philosophic principles, and how they're spread, endorsed, and politicized. The political momentum in the US now seems to be toward socialism, although this could be a media creation. I don't think it's all that substantial. I think it's more a filler in a vacuum caused by a timid, uncertain right wing. The American right, you notice, is certainly quite right not to care a whit for Trump or to help him. But as a result, the left has space to be more radical and hateful. It's not because they see Trump as pro-capitalist. He isn't. He's rich and autocratic, they say, which to them means he's a plutocrat, which to them means rule by the rich, which to them means the devil. It's not that leftists oppose autocracy, of course. They just hate it when a foe is autocratic. They don't like the competition. This alleged manifesto by Sun Kara, by the way, who's editor of a magazine called The Jacobin. And if you know who the Jacobins were, they were Robespierre's henchmen who cut off heads in the French Revolution. The current Jacobins want to murder the rich. They say this openly, that the rich should be banished now, not French royalty. The wide chasm that once existed between America's left-leaning intellectuals and America's center-right public has narrowed in recent decades. The good news is that the academia and intellectual class has actually gotten better and there are more pro-capitalists in, pro in academia, but not yet enough to make a difference and move the country decidedly and sustainably rightward towards freedom. The American public has actually moved leftward we have to admit that. They've already got a mixed economy welfare state, but seem to want still more statism in their mixed. In effect, the leftist intellectuals have warped generations of now clueless Americans. The duped pupils are older now, and they vote. They've also spawned hordes of left-leaning kids. Take a look at that. Gallup poll. What do you think of capitalism and socialism? That's about a year ago. The top of the Democrats over the last eight years, the bottom of the Republicans. Democrats differentially favor socialism while Republicans differentially favor capitalism, but the trend is quite interesting on the Democratic side. Positive view of capitalism, only 47% now. 57 have a positive view of socialism, and it's gotten more negative for the Democrats' notice. 
It looks bad. The registered Democrats and left-leaning independents comprise roughly half the electorate today. It's a large and growing body of anti-capitalist sentiment. Here it is by age. Same survey, by age. The younger the person is, the less pro-capitalist they are. And even less so now than eight years ago. So look at that. By age, people 18 to 29. In 2010, a 68% approval of capitalism, now 45. The view of socialism hasn't changed much, but apparently their positive view of capitalism has collapsed. If you go down to the older, 65 and older, there's a positive differential. That third column is the differential. So the bigger that number is, the more relatively pro-capitalist people are. So older people are more pro-capitalist. I asked a young Duke student once who was socialist why. One of the reasons they gave, and I gave this data, I said, what, what do you make of older people being so pro-capitalist, anti-socialist? And she said, they probably lived through socialism. And I said, <laughs> So wouldn't that give you some reason they know what they're talking about? No. First-hand experience is not relevant in academia. Notice uh, the, one, the green box I've labeled, age 50 to 64, the most relatively pro-capitalist people. Anyone here between 50 and 64, please stand up. If you can stand up, if you can. <laughs> Try to stand up. <laughs> okay, you're looking at, since this is a subset of objectivists, you're looking at the most pro-capitalist people on the planet. <laughs> right, sit down, sit down, sit down. I just wish you were all professors. Oh, God. First, look in the upper right. That was the vote in 2016 among Democrat primary voters. So 43% of them wanted Sanders. Wow. And he's running again, as you know. Now look to the bottom right, the Gallup poll. This is Gallup going into Venezuela in 2007 and saying, which of these two systems, look at the questions, which has more freedom to think the way one wants? Venezuelans? Socialism. That's the green line, dark green. <clears throat> Which one is uh, more peaceful and socially calm? Uh, socialism. Which one has less crime? Socialism. Which one is more just? Socialism. Better quality of education? Socialism. More wealth produced? Socialism relative to capital. In Venezuela, 2007. Now, Senator Sanders, look at this, in 2011. These days, the American dream is more apt to be realized in South America in places like Venezuela where incomes are actually more equal today than in the land of Horatio Alger, that's, uh, that's us. Who's the Banana Republic now? Apparently we are. That's his role model. Little update for Mr. Sanders. In Venezuela, they're starving and they eat their own pets. Pets on the menu as Venezuelans starve. That's from fairly recent. On the right, the Washington Post. Shortages of electricity, food, and water. Venezuelans turn to religion. Having turned to the religion of socialism, now they return to the religion of something else. By the way, democratic socialism, look at the vote shares down below. I went and collected. There were elections in Venezuela all during this time. Open, fair elections. In 98, Chavez won 56 to 44. Not a real run, run away, but that's when Chavez won. And two years later, scrapped the Constitution, uh, three years later. Then they won 60% of the vote in 2000, 63% of the vote in 2006, 55% of the vote in 2012. A real squeaker in 2013, only won by two percentage points. They keep winning despite the utter disaster in 20 years, Venezuela has gone from the richest, one of the richest countries in the world, not just in Latin America, mostly because of oil reserves found by Western oil companies, but now it's um, one of the poorest. You never hear the democratic socialists in America talk about Venezuela other than praising it the way he did. 
Never comes up in the debates. Denmark comes up way more than Venezuela. How can they get it so wrong, these students? Here's a very popular book widely assigned in college from a socialist in Britain, since passed away, but it's a very small book, but the students love it. Now, now look at this, this is the publisher's summary. Is socialism desirable? Is it even possible? In this concise book, one of the world's leading political philosophers presents with clarity the compelling moral case for socialism and argues that obstacles in the way are exaggerated. There are times, he says, when we all behave like socialists. On a camping trip, for example, Campers wouldn't dream of charging each other to use a soccer ball or fish that they happen to catch. Campers do not give merely, but get, relate to each other in a spirit of equality and community. Would, socialist, would such socialist norms be desirable across society as a whole? Why not? Why not? Why not socialism? It's like a big, uh, happy camping trip. I wrote a piece recently called Spring Break in Caracas, <laughs> noting how college students go to Spring Break in Florida and other capitalist havens, and they seem never to go to Venezuela, North Korea, or Cuba. But a Harris poll in March did ask, and half of young Americans said they prefer living in a socialist country than a capitalist country. Now, they're either completely ignorant of the history of socialism, that's possible, or they're not ignorant of it and they want it anyway. The first is an epistemological corruption. The second one's a moral one. There might also be some psychology involved. Some people are just not comfortable being free. Some of them are dependent. Some of them are large infants. They want to be taken care of. They want to be controlled. And there's a lot of control freaks out there who want to take up the job. Let's get down to some basics here. Here's a matrix that might help for the terminology. You can think of your life, your body, your business, your means of production, your personal property as you own it. But we all know ownership includes I get to control it. I get to do what I want with it. If I just have it in title only and you tell me what to do with it, what good is it? So typically, this matrix really helps, and here's how I put it. If you own and control those things, that's a system of capitalism. If there's public ownership but private control, that's a weird system, but that's called feudalism. Fascism is the weird mix of, you get to keep your private property, but we will tell you what to do with it. So you have all the responsibilities of ownership, and we have all the advantages. We will basically use you as a milch cow. We don't actually want to kill you. We want you to barely keep going so we can keep living off of you. But socialism is, and even socialists who are real serious socialists from Marx onward will say, socialism is public ownership of the means of production and public control, which they mean government control of the means of production. And interestingly, most democratic socialists don't believe that. They will say, Sanders and others. I'm not saying the government should nationalize industry. I'm not saying there should be public ownership of the means of production. I'm saying the government should massively control what people do with their lives and what people, businesses do with their assets, which is, guess what? <laughs> the loudest anti-fascists are, you conclude. Now, suppose you said, I'm not worried, they don't even know what socialism is because they just told you they're all messed up, right? So let's ask, back to Gallup. What do you think socialism means? Okay, 1949, 2018. They asked these questions in 1949. And it, it was open-ended, so people wrote down anything they thought of, and then Gallup organized them. You see how this goes? The top one, equality, equal standing, equal rights, that's a whole mixed up thing. Is that equality of results or equality before the law? It's hard to say, but in 1949, 12% of people thought that that's what socialism was, and 23% today, a quarter of people today, think it means whatever, some kind of equality. The green one's the most important, because in 1949, a third said what the definition really is. 
complete government control and ownership of the means of production and capital. That is actually the formal definition of so. But today, only 17% think that. That's sad. 17 more think it has to do with equality than have to do with government control and ownership of the means of production. So there's a real defect in people's understanding of socialism, which can make you feel better, you know, that they're advocating this thing they think is not so bad, but I think it's still troubling when the terminology is this bad. Do you notice the red one, by the way? Socialism is talking to people and being friendly and being on social media, which of course did not come up in 1949. Even though 1949 people were friendly with each other, they had cocktail parties and stuff like that. They didn't think of it as socialism. Today, is anyone here friendly with others? Show of hands. You're all socialists. You're all socialists according to this. Here's another way of thinking about what's happened. In the medieval times, the voice of God was considered to be the source of all sovereignty, the source of all legitimate government power. During the Enlightenment, very brief time when the founders operated, you could call it vox intellentia, the voice of reason. The Enlightenment, rejecting the idea that God should be the basis of government. But then vox populi replaced that in the 1800s, voice of the people. And a very famous phrase started being uttered, vox populi, vox dei. The voice of the people is the voice of God. See what's going on here? If you reject reason, if you reject the Enlightenment, and this was happening in the early 1800s, it was called the counter-Enlightenment. Hegel, the transcendentalists in America, elsewhere, they were resisting the Enlightenment. They came up with the phrase, the voice of the people is the voice of God. They replaced God with democracy. Democracy was the new God. It was the voice of the people, social subjectivism, if you will. That's what we're still living with today. I'm not going to read all these. These are all quotes from the founders warning us against democracy. Democracy is never mentioned. You know this in the US Constitution. It's not in there. It does say a Republican form of government, a Republican form of government. But look at Hamilton on the left. Of those men who've overturned liberties of republics, the greatest number have begun by paying an obsequious court to the people, commencing demagogues and ending up tyrants. Oh, they love the people. The people. If we incline too much toward democracy, we'll soon shoot into monarchy. Real liberty is neither found in despotism nor in the extremes of democracy, but in moderate governments. Our real disease is democracy. Over on the right, it's been observed that a pure democracy, if it were uh, practical, would be the most perfect government. Experience has proved that no position is more false than this one. The ancient democracies in which the people themselves deliberated never possessed one good feature of government. Their very character was tyranny, their figure, deformity. And Socrates, of course, was killed and murdered by the Athenian democracy, right? Not because he had done anything dastardly, but because they didn't like his opinions. He was corrupting the youth of Athens. This from Ayn Rand in a 1971 workshop. This is fascinating because we often think of the founders as being for the consent of the governed. That sounds unobjectable. I'm consenting. Listen to Rand on this. This is interesting. She's asked, is the consent of the governed the basis of government authority? No, for then the base would be that it was chosen or elected or sanctioned by the majority of the citizens. And if that's the source of authority, it becomes in principle to be a totalitarian government because all that's necessary is that the majority chose that. But the mere fact that a majority chose a government isn't sufficient justification for a certain government. That's merely whim worship. And it's no more valid in justifying individual action on the ground that he wanted it. The desire in politics has even less validity. And it has none in, <laughs> in ethics. <laughs> now, this is interesting. She said, notice the founders said, government derives its just powers from the consent of the governed. Not derives its powers from the consent or the desire or the whim of the governed. Only those of its powers which are just should be agreed to by the governed. 
For a government to be legitimate, the principle, the source of its authority must itself be legitimate. By that we mean morally and rationally justified. The only conceivable principle that can justify government is, a, is the protection of individual rights. That's from a newly issued book, a new textbook of Americanism, The Politics of Ayn Rand. Here's a way to summarize it. There's two types of democracy, direct and representative. Direct is people vote on issues directly, literally. What shall we do on policy? And they directly vote. Representative is they vote for people who then vote for issues. But this is non, none of this is constitutional in the sense of delimiting the scope and domain of government. So constitutional democracy is somewhat of a contradiction in terms. Any good name that democracy has today is because there's some constitution associated with it. But that's a restriction of government. That's not really something the Democrats want. It's certainly not what democratic socialists want. But in theory, democracy is supposed to be based on the will of the people. It's supposed to be self-government. It's supposed to be consent as the main justification. There's a kind of presumed rectitude in the multitude. That's a phrase from my good colleague at Duke, Mike Munger. Why is there rectitude in the multitude? <laughs> now, unanimity, of course, is impractical. So it has to be some kind of majority rule. But that means the minorities are at risk of being overridden, right? So in practice, democracies, especially the purer they are, and that's what the socialists want, it's been chaotic, disorganized, impractical. It's been prone to anarchy. It's been prone to mob rule. Which leads, by the way, to demands for law and order and a strong man. That's why they tend to be short-lived and volatile and tip into, as, as Hamilton said, tip into monarchy. What about socialism? The theory. Economics is everything. The material conditions of life are everything. They drive you. They determine you. They, you have, there's no meaning in your life That's outside of the work you do and the money you make. And capitalism is productive. They do say that. Socialists say capitalism is enormously productive, but it's immoral. It's, it's uh, immoral because it's egoistic. It's profit-obsessed. And, of course, they have this view that the capitalists exploit and rob and impoverish and alienate workers who only do all the work. You know. And to them, revolution is inevitable. The proletariat will eventually rise up and expropriate the expropriators. Most of that is Marxian language, most of it borrowed today by Democrat socialists. The practice you may know, but I have found young students don't. So it's a review even for them. I present some of this material at Duke, and the students have no idea what this is. They've never heard this. Dictatorship of the proletariat, abolition of money, property, and prices, a chaotic, dysfunctional, brutal, really murderous regimes, often imperialistic. The cases of Lenin, Stalin, Hitler, Mao, Pol Pot. People on the right know this. People on the left do not teach young people this. Here's a, here's a book that documents it all. Death by Government. Yikes. By Rummel, political scientist, Texas. The death toll from just these three. The Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, 74 years, 62 million people murdered. These aren't natural deaths. These are forced famines and other purges and other things. Communist China, 35 million. The National Socialists, 21 million. There are three types of socialism. And without going through all of this, if you want to focus, the one on the right is the one that's on the rise. It's called evolutionary democratic socialism. Early in the 1830s and 40s, the one on the left, there's something called utopian voluntarist socialism. You know what it was? Let's just all get together in communes and have co-ops and hug it out and uh, come Kimbo Yaya. We're not going to hurt anybody. We're just going to go off into our... And there were many, many experiments. There were like 50 experiments in the U.S. They would last like two or three years and fall apart. By the way, the first settlements at Jamestown and Plymouth in Massachusetts, the first couple of years were communistic. They didn't have any private property, and they all starved. So they turned it over to private property after that. So th the Thanksgiving celebration we have is because Bradford, the governor up in Plymouth, changed it to private property the next year, and they had abundance and celebrated the abundance on Thanksgiving. So you see there Robert Owen and Foyer and others. Um, that's what's called utopian socialism, if you ever 
want to know what that is. But the middle one is the Marxist one. That's the one that started in the 1840s or so. It's materialist and determinist. It's atheistic. It's much more, it's antagonistic. It's violent. It's a sudden disruption. It's autocratic. It's authoritarian. It's unilateral. Marx, Engels, Trotsky, Lenin, Stalin. Bullets, not ballots, as I put it. <laughs> the, the, the one on the right is, we want socialism, but not by violence. And we don't want it overnight. We don't think we'll get it overnight, because there'd have to be violence. <laughs> we, but we want to convince people of it and have them vote for it. The voice of the people will bring us socialism. It'll evolve over time. And what were they noticing? That in the 1800s, more and more people got the right to vote. Right? Universal suffrage. Right? Get the idea? The socialists realize, why are we waiting around for the workers to rise up and strangle the capitalists? Why don't we just rely on the majority of voters to vote for socialism? And they were noticing, by the way, and they would say, capitalism isn't really falling apart. Capitalism actually isn't impoverishing the worker. They would say this in their literature. I've read, I've done a deep dive into this, and I'm amazed, like in the 1870s, 80s, 90s, they're saying, this system is not going to fall apart. Marx was wrong. But we still want socialism. So we're going to have to convince people that labor unions or voting. Or, and, and so that's really what's going on here. Evolutionary democratic socialism. And they're much more religious, by the way. They're not atheistic. They're ethical. They're, the focus is on ethics and idealism, not economic. So they don't care if it economically doesn't work. It's not a big deal to them. And they'll call it the people's state, not a dictatorship of the proletariat. They'll focus on things like social justice, not <laughs> expropriating the expropriators. The big ideas here, people you probably don't even know, Ferdinand LaSalle, Edward Bernstein. Edward Bernstein, author of Evolutionary Socialism, was the 1899, Evolutionary Socialism. The British Fabians, you know, the British went semi-socialist in the first half of the uh, 20th century before they moved back under Thatcher. So they were into this as well, partial pro uh, nationalization of industry in Britain. So, as to what is democratic socialism, what version are we talking about? That third column. There's a lot of material here. If anyone wants these slides, um, we'll arrange to send them later if you want. Quick one on citing the Scandinavian countries, which you'll see a lot from Bernie Sanders and others. I'm only asking that we be like Denmark and, and Sweden and uh, Finland and Norway. You hear this, right? That's what I'm talking about. It's not Venezuela, and it's not Cuba, and it's not the Soviet Union. I just pulled the economic freedom indices. And personal freedom, economic freedom, human freedom, there's various measures and indices exhaustively looked at by economists and political scientists. And if you look there, the US, uh, in many cases, some of the Scandinavian countries are freer than the US. Freer. Not on every measure, but they're not, they're not far apart, and in some cases, you're better off being in them. So Bernie Sanders apparently is asking for more liberty and economic freedom in America. Um, just be aware of this. That's not an argument. They used to be much more socialistic in the 60s and 70s, and they were on decline. They've actually become more capitalist in the last 20 years. There's the freest countries in the world. There's the most social, I went and found the most socialist, and Venezuela is one of them, and they are just terribly way down the list, as you can imagine. If you're curious about the bearded fellow I just went by, ask me in the Q&A. There's a summary, but let me just say a few words in closing. We can complain endlessly, of course. Pro-capitalists can complain about the democratic socialists. <laughs> um, but I want to say something about the right wing, if you will. The conservatives, you know, rely heavily on religion and faith. And so they literally have no reason to defend capitalism. No reason. They also embrace altruism and condone the welfare state. You know this. And they periodically expand it. You see, to them, a heavenly world does exist, an ideal world apart from this corrupt and secular one. It's the idyllic, pastoral, non-industrial Garden of Eden, you know, where no work is required and everything is free. Thank you so much for that vision, say the leftists. That's what we want now. 
We want heaven on earth. Thank you, conservatives. It sounds like the Green New Deal. Your only error, the conservatives say, is your infernal impatience. You want heaven on earth here and now, delivered unto us by Saint Ocasio-Cortez. But if you pave the road to hell, to socialism, or the road to serfdom, as Hayek said, we'll be sure to compliment you because you have good intentions. Meanwhile, if you know the liveliest branch within libertarianism is the so-called bleeding heart libertarians. Bleeding heart means an overarching concern for the so-called disadvantaged, a disdain for inequality, a desire, believe it or not, to have a government guaranteed income. The libertarians are saying this which means you get paid regardless of what anyone does, regardless of actual justice. Many conservatives and libertarians you'll be noting recently are even fearful and resist using the word capitalism because they think it's been made the devil a graven image by the socialists, so they shy away from it. Or they think capitalism is synonymous with cronyism. The libertarians and conservatives say that. It's synonymous with that. In other words, you cannot have government not ruled by some economic class. Capitalism has to be the one of government run by capitalists, is what the right is saying. Possibly the worst thing that the conservatives and libertarians can be saying, if you ever heard this is, did you ever hear this? Socialism doesn't work. Did you ever hear that? Notice the premise. They want to deliver peace and liberty and prosperity, but they just fail at it. Notice the implicit compliment. You're complimenting them. You actually think after 100 years of this, of all the evidence that their desire is for peace, prosperity, and liberty. And that's why a quote doesn't work. No, actually it works perfectly. It works beautifully. Socialism works beautifully if you think of it as we don't actually want liberty, peace, prosperity, or capitalism. Now, to finish, despite how terribly wrong and unjust the Democrat socialists are, I'm willing to compliment them in one crucial respect. They deserve a lot of credit for being bold and forthright in their advocacy and their activism. They are raising big issues. They're contesting about crucial life reverberating systems, right? Capitalism, socialism, fascism, nationalism. They aren't mired really in the nitty gritty of journalistic and the policy wonk stuff. So big moral questions and the pros and cons of ri revi rival the political economic systems, that's precisely where we pro-capitalists are strong. That's our strong point, isn't it? Big, sweeping philosophic argument. Instead of waging wars against each other, we should unite and take the lead, and make the positive case. Yes, occasionally critiquing, but primarily discussing, explaining, proving how wonderful capitalism is and how best to promote it. Why? Because it's a wonderfully rational, wonderfully moral, wonderfully just, wonderfully prosperous, and fun system. Unlike our perpetually angry and bitter foes, we're typically happy and secure people. We're eager, not afraid to be free. We're not control freaks, nor do we want to be controlled by freaks or governed <laughs> by them. We prefer statesmen to politicians, and if necessary, politicians to legalized larcenists. So let's get control of our emotions. Let's exercise our reason, because we genuine friends of liberty, we're the ones who can be passionately rational about this. So let's herald capitalism. We can make the world over again, as did our enlightened forefathers, but better more just, more moral than ever before. Thank you. You like, you like free things? I have free things for you. Speaking of giving away things for free, if you go online there, you can get some free stuff. There's four reports you'll love that I wrote for clients in the last few years on this topic. And um, so you go online and get those, but then over on the right, you'll see you can also, if you want, 
subscribe to some of uh, our services. And there's an email there for our salesperson, Peter Murphy. Um, so again, stuff on the left is free. Just go on and unload as a, a PDF, or download, I mean. Unload. OK, questions? Yeah. Uh, hey. Oh. <laughs> go ahead. What's the difference between democratic socialism and social democracy? Yeah, democratic socialism wants, ultimately, public ownership of the means of production. So they want people to vote for that. Social democracy is usually a softer form of that. They don't want public ownership of the means of production. They just want a bigger welfare state. They just want a bigger redistribution of wealth than we already have. So if the US government, for example, and the subsidiary governments redistribute, redistribute, I mean tax and spend 40% of GDP in places like Denmark and elsewhere, it might be 50 or 55%. Thank you. It's the biggest difference, yeah. Yes, ma'am. No. No, the Scandinavian countries are not socialist because they don't have public ownership of the means of production. They're privately owned, for the most part, privately owned industry and companies. So in other words, the democratic socialists citing those countries as evidence of their is not true. It's not true that you can cite Denmark, Sweden, the Nordic countries as examples of socialism. They're not, is really the point there. So what would you say that they are? They're heavily big welfare states, redistributionist welfare states. Socialism is government owning the means of production, factories and companies, and oh, they own them. They take them over. There's no stock exchange. The government owns everything and controls everything. That's not true in Sweden. It's not true in the US. It's not true. It, but the democratic socialists want that. If you call yourself a socialist, that is the definition of socialism. If they say, I don't really want that, then they're not socialists. They're, they're social democrats, maybe. So, so welfare state is not necessarily? Socialism, no. The welfare state is not socialism, because it doesn't involve the government ownership of the means of production. I don't know how often to repeat that. But. Yeah, so I grew up in the Democratic Socialist Republic of Sri Lanka. I'm pretty convinced of the evils of socialism, except for education and healthcare because of my own experience. I have a hard time convincing other people as well because of my own experience. So um, I would like to hear from you the argument for private education and private healthcare. I can't give you that right here, but probably the best source is uh, Brad Thompson has written on mm -hmm. the private case for education in the objective standard. So I would try to start with that at least. Okay. But you remind me of uh, Sri Lanka, but India, you want examples of democratic social. India was democrat socialist from 1948 to roughly 1991, a complete disaster. They voted for socialism over and over again. The British governments until Margaret Thatcher post-war mostly democratic socialism, they were actually taking over the means of production. That's why she privatized so many things after 1979. There's many case studies of this, and they're all disastrous. Thank you. Welcome. I have a middle-aged couple from Russia. The man works for uh, Amazon. He's very intelligent, very knowledgeable about um, computers and everything. He tells me, uh, his parents and relatives back in Russia think they're living under capitalism. I said, that's funny. People in America do, too. <laughs> uh, do you have any statistics as to how many people in the United States think they're actually living under capitalism now? Yeah, the, the statistics are people are not all that surprised about what, they're not all that duped about what system. They believe they're living in a mixed system. So. When you look at the polls, it does not say 80% of Americans think they're living under capitalism. It says they're living under a mixed system. See, I think the most important thing to learn about this mixture is um, the democratic socialists today are saying they want a bigger mixture of socialism, right? Almost every ill that they identify is due to their part of the mixture. I mean, whether it's schooling, Ponzi scheme, which is Social Security, bad money coming out of their central bank, you know what I mean? The Democrat-controlled mayors, the systems, the Indian reservations, a complete disaster, the VA hospital. Wherever you look, the most disastrous American experience have heavy socialism in it, right? So your conclusion would be, we need to get out that poisonous mix and put in the nutritional mix. Um, but Americans aren't duped. Americans know it's a mixed system. They're not quite sure why it's moving in one direction or another. We should probably well, take, a, blaming, we should probably take other questions. They're always blaming capitalism, though. 
I mean, yeah. like it's capitalism they're living in, and they, they don't, don't like they, it. They don't say that. Well, that's what but they don't saying. want pure capitalism. That's true. Yeah. Yeah, doesn't, Not you the lec doesn't your lecture prove that Ayn Rand hit the nail on the head that the morality of altruism makes it inevitable that we move to more and more socialism? The, yes. the communists claim the moral high ground, <laughs> and nobody knows how to take it away from them. Okay. I agree. Next. Hi. I wonder if you could distinguish a little bit more um, between capitalism and feudalism and how anything public is the root of that distinction. I, th I thought that's what I took from the chart. Yeah. Um, feudalism was a weird system where um, uh, the lords of the manor, so to speak, uh, owned the property. So that sounds like socialism. But they, had, they allowed the tenant farmers and others a fair amount of freedom to till and keep some of their product. So that's why it's in this weird case, and that was pre-capitalist, of course, but that's when it's in this weird case of, it's almost like the opposite of fascism, where you can own it, but we'll take all the fruits of your labor. Um, um, so that's the major distinction between feudalism and capitalism. Capitalism is private ownership and private control. Um, the public word is a little weird to use, because if I said to you, publicly traded company, what is that? It is a big, large company with many, many shareholders, right? It has nothing to do with socialism. It's not government control of those companies. It's broad shareholder ownership. That's a key part of capitalism as well. So the, the, word, of you, the word of public versus private is somewhat of a murky distinction, but I, I thought the matrix might be helpful. Thank you. Thank you. So another question on definitions on that uh, grid. I saw that grid when I was in high school and I learned this definition of fascism, but I don't think any other time that anyone has used that word, it has seemed to right. be that same definition. Both the right and the left call each other fascist. What do you think people think they're saying? Or what uh, are they referring to? Unfortunately, uh, I, I think the fact that fascism is so closely associated with Hitler that it's, it's, it's um, uh, bound up with the racism and the white supremacism and the Aryanism of Hitler. And so fascism is kind of a stand-in now for you're a racist and you think some cultures are superior to others. You know what I mean? They wouldn't say, oh, that's uh, private ownership in, in title only and government control. I think that second one is really the root of it. Um, for, for example, Mussolini didn't have a racist element to fascism. He had fascism. Pure and simple, so to speak, right? Um, so if you're able to like distinguish out these more local distinctions, uh, that's the essence of, of fascism. So, um, I mean, in that regard, the real threat here is fascism. But I think one thing I want to leave you with, I the one thing I want to leave you with is, if you didn't get the point, democracy isn't really white. It's not, it, it's a whitewash, it's an attempted whitewash, because it's kind of counting on people having a fuzzy feeling about democracy. But I hope it was clear from my talk that I think there's a danger in democracy, obviously. There's a danger in saying uh, whatever the people want, they get. And the, the socialists are counting on this. They're hoping for this. And the other way of looking at this is when a conservative might say something like, you're contradictory, you're, you're hypocrites. You know that once socialism exists, democracy will, will be wiped out. You know, there'll be no more voting and everything. And often that's true, right? But this idea of, I'm against socialism because I want to preserve democracy, that's not the way to go. The, dem the socialists want democracy. They want unlimited majority rule. And, and many of them will refer to the system they want, by the way, as economic democracy, where uh, you know, there isn't any private ownership and everyone's on the board. You know, everyone from the, sh from the janitor to whatever is in the board boardroom you know, deciding what to do with everybody else's property. So, so part of my point here is, yes, they are whitewashing an evil. And um, apparently, most young people don't know what, e what evil that really is, socialism. But also, there's a danger in uh, democracy itself. It's, it's not really as white or in, in the sense of being good and moral as people assume. Okay, so I think that I think we're out of time, Conrad. Okay, thank you all very much. Thank you.